Hey, everybody, and welcome to Cancer in the Room podcast. Our goal on this podcast is to highlight the inspiring stories of athletes, sports executives, and media personalities who have faced or beaten cancer. Now, in sports, the term cancer in the room is often applied to a person whose behavior is somewhat disruptive or negative to their teammates or to the organization as a whole. Now, in our particular case, all of us on this podcast have cancer or continue to battle each day. Our spin is we all have to deal with cancer in the room, and yet we have to strive to push forward in a positive manner. Plus, we love talking about sports. My name is Bryn Griffiths, and he is Dave Jameson. Our guest today is a four-time Stanley Cup champion, 17 seasons as a player in the National Hockey League. He's been a general manager and both a head coach and an assistant coach at the highest level in the game. Over the years, he shared his insight and knowledge as a television analyst. Craig McTavish, welcome to Cancer in the Room. Craig, we got to kick things off with, it's always the first question we ask on this podcast, and that is, one, what kind of cancer, and do you remember the first time you were approached by your doctor who gave you the news that this is what you were going to have to deal with? Do you remember that? Yeah, uh, our, yeah, I, I do remember, uh, <laughs> as we all do, when we uh, have our first interface with, uh, with a cancer diagnosis, but it was uh, Halloween. I can't remember what year it was, but uh, we were having uh, the normal get together at my place in the West End where all the neighbors and the, our young kids would uh, congregate. The, the adults would, uh, you know, have dinner and a drink or two and the uh, kids would go out in the neighborhood. So one, one of my our good friends and neighbors back in those days was Dr. John Keoy. And so John and I were having a discussion and I told him I had a little lump on the side of my neck. Uh, and he took a look at it and said at that time, don't worry about it. You know, it's not lymphoma or anything like that. Well, the next day he called me and said, maybe you should go uh, get that looked at. And uh, I thought, uh, you know, that, that was probably a good idea. And I went uh, to the U of A and had a biopsy done just before I went to the Spengler Cup to coach Canada at the, uh, at the, at the annual Christmas tournament in DeVos, Switzerland. So I remember talking to the technician that did it. And you don't get too much information out of them. I said, but everything's okay, right? And he said, uh, well, it could be better. <laughs> so that, that kind of started it. Then I went across uh, into Switzerland to coach the team. Never really thought about it too, too much after that. But I noticed my wife, Debbie, was pretty distracted during the, uh, during the tournament. I mean, you're always busy coaching the team, so... She had uh, got got the uh, diagnosis or what, whatever you want to call it back, and was already putting uh, putting uh, the next steps uh, in place for me. So that was my soiree into the cancer world. But you know, everybody that gets a diagnosis, it's it's always shocking. You, you're shocked and horrified, and then. Uh, then you settle into the, uh, the, the the fight and what do I have to do? Craig, one of the things I know from my personal experience was you get the news and then you process it on some level and then you have to make calls to people in your life to tell them. And, and you know, what was that reaction? What was that whole process like for you to have to let, you know, children know and family members, that kind of that kind of thing? Yeah, that, that, I mean, I was buoyed by the fact that uh, mine, according to the physicians at that time, was really treatable. So I wasn't that rattled about it. I mean, I'm not saying it was uh, like spraining your ankle or something like that, but uh, I wasn't all that rattled by it. Uh, you know, after a week or so, but yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to, uh, to, to tell uh, your children and that, and uh, you know, it, but it, uh, I, I was reasonably certain I was going to be fine. When you take a look, there's some other famous NHLers that have had to deal with this sort of thing. Did you hear from anybody, anybody come out of the woodwork and, and you thought it's great to get a call or be contacted by that? Or did people just kind of back off for a little bit? Ah, uh, I think it was pretty quiet. You know, your real close network of friends, they're always, uh, you know, going to be uh, engaged in a great support system for me. 
but uh, you know, we we kept it pretty tight back back in those days. But I remember thinking uh, about insurance and stuff like that. You know, like it's I I'd, I'd always make jokes about life insurance as a, a lot of us have, you know, over the years about didn't like how you collected and those types of jokes. But when you have a young family. You know, that, that, that to me was a good takeaway that uh, I was fortunate I had some, so that gave me some peace of mind. But when your kids are young and your, your, uh, you know, your, your family's young, it's, it's comforting to know that you have some sort of uh, insurance in, in case something devastating happens. You know, you, you work so hard to become an NHL player. You obviously have been a coach, a GM, and you've had a lifetime in hockey, and that's taken a lot of physical uh, will. Uh, this is a different kind of challenge. Did you draw on the experience as a professional athlete and some of the things that got you to where you are, the highest level in the world, in your, your fight with cancer, even though, as you said, you, you felt good or fairly confident going in anyhow? Yeah, I think we're all, you know, products of our own experiences and for me i i mean i'm i'm not one to ever be too empathetic of my own situation so it, it's it's a more pragmatic in my approach of doing things and you know you just you know i take great comfort in trying to do and control the things that i can control and being able to uh, you know get away from anything or a lot of things out of my control and that's kind of the way I approached it uh it was you know wait and see for me that, yeah. uh, you know as as this thing progressed at some point I would I knew that I'd have to get treated and I have been treated I mean that that was difficult uh chemotherapy affects people differently and you get different it's a w wonderful drug obviously but uh, it has a number of side effects, and some people are more affected by it. I mean, to both your experiences on that, uh, and it it wasn't uh, it wasn't that pleasant. I remember getting my first treatment, and uh, went up to the cross, and I was there with my wife Debbie at, at the time, and uh, you know, I felt great after. You know, they pumped you full of it I, I i felt good i i was hungry we uh you know debbie and i went to the high level diner and uh i for 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 some breakfast and i had uh this this omelet that i used to always get there with the uh, the salsa and, and and whatnot on it and uh man i've never had that since <laughs> you get home and uh you know, then the nausea starts and you always kind of identify that associated with the last thing you ate. So, it, yeah, it was, that, that part wasn't that easy to deal with. But I remember, uh, you know, uh, fr and, you know, different friends have different ideas on how to handle nausea. So guys would be coming over, <laughs> bringing me uh, their version of the best way to combat the nausea, a good buddy of mine, you know, came to the door with uh, uh, a bunch of lefties, and <laughs> oh yeah, it was. Uh, I'm not saying I used any, but uh, it, it was a thought that counts. Well, one of the things that we've talked about is that okay, so we're also very public. You are more public than we would be. Did you go the quiet route or did you go a little more vocal or did you try to slide under the radar screen? Uh, how did you handle that? Oh, as quietly as possible. Okay. You know, like, yes, it's, you know, it, it, uh, I continued on. I can't even remember what I was doing back in, in during the diagnosis. It's been that long. I'm sure I was working for the Oilers in some capacity, but I don't, I don't think I was coaching. I, well, I wasn't because I was at the Spangler Cup, but uh, right. you know, I, I was doing something for the Oilers for sure. In terms of you know, as you say, you're you're many years removed from the diagnosis and the treatment, and you're living a healthy life. 
Um, do you do you stay connected to the cancer community, if you will, either through fundraising or you know awareness you've raised in in any way? Not too much, no. I mean, my oncologist that I had was wonderful, and uh, he's he's subsequently retired and moved on. Uh, I'm down first. You, you get blood tests every three or four months, and then every half year, then every year, and now I'm every couple of years that I'll go in and get blood work done. Uh, if you're not feeling well, it kind of hangs in the back of your mind a little bit that uh, you got to get tested, but I... I I don't really, I, as I said earlier, I've got it so far in the back of my head, I, don't, I rarely ever think about it. Well, you just touched on something that I know I've struggled a little bit with, and that is it's one thing to beat it physically, but, you know, every time a shoulder gets sore or something else bothers me, my brain kind of defaults a little bit to, oh, my goodness, is this coming back in a different form? But then I'm able to kind of wash it away pretty quick. But I think that that's my nature I'm, it sounds like that's kind of the same with you where you don't get too wound up about it. You just deal with everything as it comes. Is that fair to say? That's that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way I deal with it. And who knows what the future's, what the future holds. And as my buddy always says, nobody's promised tomorrow. And, right. uh, you know, cancer, I mean, the, the irony for me in all this through the treatment is that you know, in a world that we live in where everybody's so self-absorbed a lot of the times, rightly or wrongly, that, uh, you know, you can uh, have a bit of a negative slant to it. But I, I don't know what your experiences were. But when I was at the cross, they were the most upbeat people, uh, not just the practitioners, but the patients. And yes. uh, they were so optimistic. It gives your life a bit of a different perspective too, right? Yeah. And I think most people would say that. Uh, but yeah, the thing that struck me was just how optimistic other patients were with much, much worse situations than I had. And, uh, you know, so, so upbeat. They were, you know, really inspiring to me and anybody that goes in there to, to fight it. It's a... It's a real tight knit support system that you automatically have the minute you walk through those doors. To take a look at your career yeah. in the National Hockey League, and I'm just going to throw this out: player, general manager, coach. What you're all three, but is there one thing you're more than yeah. the other? Do, would you view yourself more as a player or a coach or a general manager? I was thinking about this on the drive over today, and I went, well, man, he's pretty much done it all, and you've you've coached at yeah. different levels, and you've been a general manager. Like, well, How do you view yourself when you look at back at your career? Just a career hockey guy. It's all part of it. I mean, uh, I was dabbling with getting out of playing or getting out of hockey when I was done playing, but – I got, I got drawn back in and I, I you know, I, I've been in really ever since, since I retired in 1997, ironically from St. Louis where I'm back. But uh, by far the, the most gratifying position that I've had is player. And I was really fortunate to catch on with, you know, one of, one of the greatest teams and the greatest people and leaders and you know you just i was taking all that stuff for granted uh that it was you know uh that everybody was that most organizations were that well functioning and uh you know it, it's it's not the case where you know slats was an unbelievable leader and uh john muckler was a fantastic technical guy and ted green was an unbelievable liaison between the players and the coaching staff. And none of those individuals were more important than the other one. And, uh, you know, it, and just incredible leadership. I mean, what's, what's leadership really, uh, but somebody that can apply the best perspective to difficult times that you have. And we always had that whether it was Gretz or Mark or Kevin, those guys were 
incredible. Like whether it was, hey, let's let's lighten up and relax a little bit. We don't need to be as uptight about this or just the opposite. Time to get back to uh, back to work and apply ourselves here and, you know, get and, and generally when you have the best players, you're capable of being on the accelerator. Uh, when you need to put the gas on, and 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 we were, but I mean, Slats was a fantastic leader, and I tell people that Slats was a t- not the type of leader that if you were late for the bus, he was going to leave you. You know, Slats was a type of leader that was waiting for you, and then he'd give you shit. Yeah, yeah, basically, <laughs> but, you're right, uh, absolutely correct. Yeah, but. Craig, uh, we live in a time where we've got so much information available to fans and the media, you know, analytics, the various sites. um, And what that's given rise to is a lot of people think they can be general managers and build NHL teams. You've actually done it for a living. Can you give us an idea, and by extension, the people watching this, how hard a job it is to build a team, let alone a successful one? Well, it's... uh you know, it's incredibly difficult and you're, you're managing so many other things now that, uh, that I, I think the managers of the past re- really didn't have to manage. And uh, you've got to be aggressive. You've got to be patient. You've got to satisfy the season ticket base. You've got to show progress. You've got to be progressive in your approach to the game. And, you know, it, it's it's the, the guys that do it best are the guys that draw from the network of their staff. I mean, the, the, it's not what you don't know that will get you in trouble. It's what you think you know and don't know. And it's the arrogance of thinking you know which will kill you. And, uh, you know, you really have to be open-minded on your decisions. You're making the final decision, but you have to leverage – the support that you have from your network, whether it's the scouts, whether it's your analytics guys, whether it's the coaches, and take in all that information because, you know, no, nobody nobody can do it by themselves, that's for sure. 2006, you got the team all the way to the seventh in deciding game of the Stanley Cup final. It would be easy to say that might be a regret that you didn't – quite pushed them over the top but conversely you took a team that was really kind of scrambling a little bit just to get them into the postseason you knock off the number one team the Detroit Red Wings they had the president's trophy all wrapped up and everything like that how do you view that whole run in 2006 because it was a lot of fun to watch and I got to think from your perspective it was uh, equally as much fun just to be part of that well it was so much fun and the great thing of coaching and playing and managing at Edmonton is everybody shares in the success of the hockey team. And you go out and you run into people, you know, in the grocery store, wherever, and it's always, hey, we played well last night. And we, I, I love that about Edmonton, that everybody takes ownership of, of the hockey club. And I was really happy to see the players last year have a run so they could really feel – the importance and the appreciation that the, the fans uh, have for, for for the Edmonton Oilers. But uh, when I look back at that run in 2006, I'm more disappointed now than I was in 2006 when we lost. And, right. uh, you know, you and I and Robin had a good discussion about that many years ago. Not many years ago, but a couple of years ago that you guys really drew that out in me on how how I felt about it and uh, nobody's really asked me much about that but you know the whole we we played so well in game six that you know we just I just felt like you know it was game seven was going to be an extension of game six and they got better and we weren't quite as good and uh you know I think I could have done a better job uh challenging the players or I don't know. I mean, they probably would have looked at me like I had two heads because we played the best game. I've, I've, I mean, we were more dominant in that game six. And I think I remember in any of the, any of the, uh, my series as a player, it was just a, a, a wipeout. And I remember walking out of the building at Northlands and, 
you know, everybody was telling me how Peter Laviolette just ripped into his team. And I thought, okay, well, we, we, we probably got him right where we want him, but we did. And so yeah. I, I feel bad for, you know, the guys that haven't had a Stanley Cup, the Ethan Morrows of the world. And, uh, Jared Stoll, I think, got uh, got one in L.A., but uh, yeah. Rafi Torres and uh, Ryan Smith, for sure. Uh, Prongs got one. Fernando Pisani, but, I mean, that, that was – that has a greater implication over time than it did right there at that moment. I was like, ah, you know, it's disappointing, but man, we had a heck of a run. But now I'm disappointed. Yeah, yeah. Sorry for bringing that up again. Brought you down on uh, yeah. You know, we're trying to bring everybody up here today. I, I, I that's yeah. on me that one. I sorry. Uh, Craig, the game that, that looks so tough. different in 2023. It has for several years. I know it's decidedly different than when you played. Um, what do you like the way the game is today in the NHL? And, you know, is there a, an element that isn't there that you wish was? Well, yeah, I, I love the skill in today's game and uh, the speed in today's game. I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a bit of gamesmanship that's lacking that I, I feel like, the players in the uh, earlier 70s and the 80s had. I mean, we didn't have all the, the uh, access to skill development that the players have now, but we played hockey. You know, we played, uh, you know, you dropped the puck and you played shinny, so you, you learned how to support the puck and how to play with each other. And you, you really, in today's game, there are a lot of people, and I use yak, uh, Neil Yakupov is as an example of a guy that if you watch practice, he's there's your best player. You know, you're watching practice. He can skate, he can shoot, he can handle the puck. But when the puck drops, it's more difficult for him, or it was more difficult for him to play with people and move the puck and support the puck and give the players the puck when they need it at the right time. Where guys, I mean, there's still plenty of guys in the game that do that. I mean, Pronger was a genius, uh, Nick Lidstrom and those guys. I mean, they, they had great gamesmanship. But I think the skill level of today's player is is very high. I miss the battles in front of the net. I, I, I wish the league would allow those net front battles to go. Uh, I love watching Craig Simpson go. I mean, he's suffering the effects of it now because he's – back problems and so forth so he might have a different take on it but you know he really paid a price at the net and uh you know and and that that price and that those battles i used to love watching and there's not as much of that anymore you had an opportunity to watch a battle of alberta for the first time in a very very long time recently can you compare do you like to compare or do you just like the hockey that you saw between edmonton and calgary this last time yeah, well, it was pretty impressive, too, now. I mean, both those teams. I love watching the Oilers. I mean, we're so lucky. Uh, Edmontonians are so lucky, as you guys all know, to, to have Connor McDavid there in his prime. And, uh, you know, Leon, too, as well, is not far behind him. And to watch those two night in and night out, I mean, that is uh, – pretty spectacular the things that he does uh and they do together are, are pretty spectacular but the battle of alberta all, all our most memorable or my most memorable meetings were always in the dressing room at the saddle dome you know there was always because there was more on the line you know and you're you're well, you're I, I gotta jump in why yeah. were the games yeah. between edmonton and calgary crazier there than in Edmonton, I, I never figured that out. Was it? Why was that? Do you, any idea? Well, they were homers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, that's a, that's that's a good question. But they they were pretty crazy everywhere uh, in both buildings. Like it, it's they they had a tough team, and we had to make sure that they didn't know how close they were to be to being able to beat us. And that's what was at stake night in, night out. 
that we didn't want them knowing that they were close. And I mean, obviously they won in uh, uh, 1986, but I, I still thought we were we, we were we were better. They they would disagree. But, uh, we, I do. Do I even bring up Harvey the Hound? Are you over that now? You and Harvey are over all that. Well, yeah. I, I'm. Uh, it never gets old, Bren. I know, and and I I will say that I'm probably the the worst guy to keep bringing it up. Okay, let's move off Harvey though. Career highlights for you as a player. Uh, you you won your first cup with the Oilers in the late '80s, but you also won on Broadway. How do those even compare? Yeah. for you. Well, Broadway, in spite of the fact that I went there with a bunch of Oilers, so it was really easy for me to go into the dressing room. There were six other guys that, uh, that I played with, so so that was easy. But it had more of a I had more of a mercenary feel to that. Yeah. Like it was, I came in at the deadline, you know, joined uh, what was a a team that won the President's Trophy, and one was. You know, fantastic, uh, you know, fantastic memory. You know, the, the, the city of New York went crazy. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel like I had the ownership in, in that cup like I had maybe more so in 90, where it was a little bit more unexpected. So it was m maybe more satisfying from a personal and professional level in 90 with Bucky and Mark Lamb and, you know, Simmer. And I mean, it was, and it was without Wayne, which, you know, was hard. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was hard to win without Wayne. So we weren't the prohibitive favorites that we always were when Wayne played. Uh, I mean, who knows how many cups the Oilers would have won if they were able to keep that team together. So uh, you're coaching again. When does this end for you? Like, do you just keep you just you just seem to love coaching, and you love taking on well, coaching had, challenges. Are you going to keep doing a, this? Well, I had a year off last year, and I didn't. I, I'm not a guy that to, to sit back and uh, do nothing. So I, I like to stay busy. I still felt at that point that I had a lot to offer a team or something that maybe not a lot, but something to offer a team. Um, I mean, it's not gone as we would have projected here in St. Louis. It's been disappointing. In this game, it's all about meeting and exceeding expectations, and expectations are always barking at your heels. And, uh, you know, they, they've caught up and passed here where we're behind our expected level of performance, which is never easy in this business. And as long as I've been in it, losing is, you know, it, it never gets easy. And uh, we've done too much of that. Craig, finally, from me, um, I know you've done the executive MBA program at Queens. And um, I, I just wonder, you know, education clearly has meant, and I would suspect because you're still an educator being a coach, what that role has had in your life. Well, I always found the people that transitioned best from playing into another area or another career were people that had some sort of uh, – uh, continuing education, whether it's a law degree and the people that I kind of uh, uh, admired were always people that were fortunate, that were insightful enough to do something else. And, because there is a lot of living left when you're done playing hockey. And to me, when I was done playing, I, all, I, I was going right into uh, take an MBA at the U of A at that time. And then I got back into the coaching uh, and wasn't able to do it for another 10 or 12 years. But I, I did eventually uh, take uh, the MBA at Queens and really enjoyed it. Loved the people, really go-getters, uh, and learned a lot. I don't know whether I can apply any specific things, but it just education enhances your enjoyment of life, I've always felt. And, uh, you know, you're better served and understand the way the world works and the economy works and so forth with, with, uh, with for me, anyways, that, that, that it helped me understand. Having worked uh, on the hockey side, 
and, yep. and taking that education and, and having worked on the hockey side, then you veer over to the dark side and do some media work. Like, what was that all about? I thought you were great, by the way, but yep. how was that for you? That, that was fun. It just wasn't busy enough. You know, it was, I, and how can you not like working with uh, Gene Principe and uh, to a much lesser extent, Bob Stoffer. But sure. uh, he, he and I clashed throughout my tenure as a coach. And, but he and I, are, I mean, we've had a lot of fun. He's helped me a lot uh, in, uh, as I got into, into broadcasting and we always have, uh, fun together on the air and I've, I've enjoyed working with Bob and, uh, for sure. Gene is a, is a, a you know, local treasure. Thanks for your time. Uh, it's not easy to talk about cancer. Uh, you've flown through it, and you're sending a very positive message on that front. And it's been just a pleasure working with you uh, on the hockey side and from a media perspective. And thanks for your time today. We appreciate it. Yeah, no, no problem. I enjoyed the discussion. And uh, nice to meet you, Dave. And Bryn, we'll catch up uh, down the road. Okay, Mac, thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. And we've watched with pride on how you've handled the cancer thing and also how upfront you were on all of that. So congratulations and thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thank you for being with us as we talk sports and cancer on Cancer in the Room. We really hope the story shared today helped to make your day better and inspire you to recognize so many have gone through so much and there's positive stuff happening all the time on the beat cancer front. Okay, now if you have a comment on today's podcast or a suggestion of somebody maybe you'd like us to track down, then please feel free to drop us a note. You can send us an email to me, Bryn, at road55.ca. That's B-R-Y-N at road55ca. And you can also check out our Twitter feed too, which is at Cancer in the Room. And yes, we also have a website, which is www.cancerintheroom.com. And don't forget... Do not forget, you can catch us at any of your favorite of your candy sites like Apple, Spotify, Google, etc. Just subscribe, and then every time we drop a new episode, it automatically goes to your mobile device. It's really simple, so make sure you tell your friends too. Now, on behalf of Dave, I'm Bryn, and thanks for joining us. This series is proudly produced by the team at Road 55. Road 55 creates content that connects. For more information, check our website, www.road55.ca.